guys to church.
morning and welcome back to our Sunday service morning here in the Bronx. We are part of New York City Church of Christ and we are so glad that you have joined us this morning to hear the word, the word of God. So um, I want to welcome you, your family, your friends, co-workers, anyone that is open to hear God's word. As so we conclude of this month, that we've been celebrating the black history. It's your history, it's my history. So help us to understand why people have fought for the right, what is right in our own life for, for equality. So this morning also and today we are in my beautiful country also, we are celebrating the, the Dominican independence. It's a beautiful to know the history. It's good to know history and, and to learn what people have done in order to uh, bring justice and freedom to others. So as uh, so we uh, um, get ready to hear the word, I would like to share one scripture that uh, I would like you to reflect what it means freedom. And it's in 2 Corinthians 5.21. It reads, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know how good it is when somebody takes our responsibility, when someone pays for our debt? That's amazing. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. So it's good to know the history, how people have fought for freedom, uh, for equality, but also, it's good to know the story about Jesus. And we can find this story, this beautiful story in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. So, once again, welcome to our Sunday service here in the Bronx. And, and get ready, because Maurice is, going, Maurice is going to preach about Teach Me to Forgive. Once again, welcome to our Sunday service. At this moment, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for another opportunity you've given us to learn. It's good to know, Father, about history, about what people have done in order to serve others. But most important is to know the Jesus story, what he did to each one of us, regardless of what we have done in our life. Thank you so much for your love. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm Mike Tolliver, and we're part of the International Churches of Christ. On February 24th, Russia sent their military forces across the border into the neighboring country, Ukraine. Ukraine is in a state of emergency with battles going on across the country. Bombs and missiles are exploding in the capital of Kiev as fighting begins there. We have seven churches in Ukraine with a total of 2,000 members. Kiev brothers and sisters have literally experienced the ground shaking after explosions and planes and missiles whistling overhead. They are hiding in bomb shelters and living in fear for their lives. Thankfully, miraculously, it seems, as of the recording of this video, everyone is safe and they still have internet connection. They are praying together, sharing verses together, and encouraging one another. There is even a prayer group of Russian and Ukrainian ministry leaders praying for peace. Here's Taras Medvedev's address to the house church leaders in Kiev. Хочу предложить вам следующие несколько рекомендаций. Первое – это договориться, пока есть связь. Договориться, что вы с вашими домашками собираетесь в Zoom. Второе – о физических нуждах, у кого какие нужды есть. То есть мы говорим о том, что, возможно, это еда, возможно, это какие-то медикаменты. Мы будем стараться донести их тоже в, в офис церкви, вот, для того, чтобы могли... Насколько это возможно, удовлетворить, покрыть эти нужды. Поэтому давайте будем держать наш фокус на Христе, не отводить свой взгляд от Него. Next door to Ukraine, our sister church in Moldova has responded to the crisis. Sean and Lena Wooten 
are leading the Revive team and work for the European Mission Society. They have been busy organizing shelter for the Ukrainians who have crossed the border. Sean hosts a daily update and prayer time on Facebook. The Revive team landed here um, in October, and now it's become our center for uh, refugees coming out of the Ukraine. And uh, we're here, as you can see, people are checking in. Um, we'll run out of resources. So we're putting together a plan. Like I said, I'm in Kishinev right now, even as I'm sitting here on this call, there's brothers and sisters trickling in um, from all over the Ukraine that we're able to get across the border. Um, at this moment, they're not allowing men from the ages of 18 to 60 to leave the country. I just got news that one of our dear friends, he and his wife and their four-year daughter just got up to the border and they turned him away and they said goodbye to each other at the border, the wife and the daughter, and he has to head back. We were so encouraged to see hundreds of disciples praying together online at Facebook this week. It's daily at 2 p.m. Eastern time, United States, 9 p.m. Paris time. Meanwhile, disciples in Russia have also fasted and prayed for the situation in Ukraine. There are complexities to this situation, but without a doubt, we are all unified worldwide in our prayers for peace, for wisdom given to our world leaders, and prayers for all people of Ukraine to be blessed with safety. May God guide the steps of all his people across this war-torn nation. Hope Worldwide noted that though men 18 to 60 years of age cannot leave the country, we expect hundreds of disciples, women, the elderly, and children to flee to Moldova without anything, and we hope to provide food and shelter. Of course, the European Mission Society is already on the ground in Moldova, anticipating and organizing for their arrival. So what can we do to help? If you would like to support our brothers and sisters in need at this time, please go to hopeww.org or also euromissions.org. At both websites, you can donate to help the disciples in the crisis in Ukraine. Next, go to Facebook where you can learn more at the ICOC Pray Ukraine webpage and pray with disciples from around the world. Then say a prayer. Grab the hand of your roommates or spouse and beseech the Almighty to intervene powerfully for the safety of all people in danger in Ukraine. Our message to disciples in danger across Eurasia, you are not alone. We are with you. God bless. And of course, we'll see you soon at Disciples Today and the Kidogo YouTube channel with more updates. Hi, I'm Jada King, and in honor of Black History Month, we will be performing Lift Every Voice and Sing. Lift Every Voice and Sing was written in 1903, and it is seen as an African-American anthem. It is a strong reminder that even in the most challenging times, we can lift our voices and sing to God who hears us, sees us, and who loves us. In Romans 8 and 37, the scripture reads, In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us.
Good morning. My name is Troy Figueroa, and I have the privilege to share the contribution message with you this morning. Uh, turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16, and we'll read through verse 17. But before we read, just to share a little background of the story. You had the king of Aram and the king of Israel that continue to battle, but every time they went into battle, the king of Aram would be defeated by the king of Israel. And he, one of the reasons why he was being defeated is he found out that God was revealing all of his plans, his strategic plans to defeat Israel to Elijah. And Elijah, of course, would go and he would tell the king of Israel and he would lose the battle. But his idea was, which was would be the right idea, if you're in the army, is to go destroy the source of me losing these battles. And that source was Elijah. So now Elijah and his servant is in a city called Dauphin. So now his servant gets up and he goes to get some water that morning. But when he looks up, he sees this whole vast army surrounding the city of Dauphin. And he runs back to Elijah and he says, Elijah, there's an army surrounding us. And Elijah looks and he says, okay, we're okay. And he's like, what? Okay, he's probably getting old. <laughs> Something is wrong. I'm telling you, there's a city of, 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 of Arabs surrounding us. And he's like, and Elijah turns around and he prays. So let's look at the text. It says, don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. And when you guys get a chance, just read the rest of the text. It's incredible. It's great. But it builds us to a place where we won't deal with our fear. We would deal in trusting in God. Because today, age, we see, we look outside, we see economically what's happening to this world. Health-wise, what's happening to the world we live in today politically, in all other fashions of it, employment. And we fear that if we give our whole heart financially, physically, whatever, whatever we're challenged to give in, that we might get hurt. And we have to pray just as Elijah oh, prayed that the servant eyes will be open to see God in the midst of all of it. What will happen if we don't give is the things we need to think about. And what will happen if we don't give and trust in God to take care of us, we would never see the power he has and what he has in store for us. So as we give today, let's give with the, the, the courage and the faith that God will continue to open up our eyes and our hearts as we give. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much, God, for today and the life that you have given us, Father. We pray, God, that you will open up our, our eyes, Father. You will help us to see the power in giving, Father, and what you have in store for us as we give. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hey.
Good morning and welcome once again to the Bronx region of the New York City Church of Christ. We're glad you're able to join us here today and we are encouraged and inspired as we celebrate Black History Month with our final sermon in the month of February. Today we're going to take a look in the book of Philemon. And as we study Philemon, we're going to look at three different people. One is the Apostle Paul. Now we know Apostle Paul was once a persecutor of the church, but yet he was on the road to Damascus and was converted, became a Christian, and did incredible things for God's kingdom. We're also going to take a look at Onesimus, who was a slave that ran away from his obligations, his master, went off, and on his journey, he ended up meeting the Apostle Paul. He became a Christian, and then Paul was sending him back to his slave master by the name of Philemon. And this is a very interesting story because we're going to look at the Apostle Paul, Onesimus, and Philemon. And as we do this, we can really place ourselves in the hands, in the, in the voyage of Onesimus, the former slave to Philemon. And in doing this, we're going to take a look at three different ways that we are very similar to Onesimus, the former slave. Because in doing this, we're going to be able to appreciate our salvation in Christ Jesus so much more. Because the ways that we can relate to him are ways that we can also see ourselves when it comes to our relationship with God. So without any further ado, let's jump into the book of Philemon. We're going to start in verse 1. This is what it says. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an older man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, Welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Again, I want to talk about three specific things that we see in the life of Onesimus that we ourselves can relate to. And the first one is this. We have an unbelievable substitute. We have an unbelievable substitute. Look at verse 17. Here's the condition of what Paul is saying. He says, so if you consider me a partner. So Paul begins with a condition. This is what he says, if you consider me a partner. 
Now, in the Greek, the word partner is not like as we would use it today, where a friend or a co-worker. No, as it used in the Greek is koinonia. In other words, fellowship, togetherness. That's what it's referred to as. A partnership based upon their life in Christ. So he says, if you consider me a partner, koinonia, this kind of relationship, a life in Christ together, then this is what I would like you to do. This is the condition that the Apostle Paul was writing to Philemon. You got to remember, this is a letter, something that as he, as he opened it up and he read it and he says, you are my fellow partner, koinonia, my partner in the walk for Christ. If you consider me this, then this is what I want you to do. Now, Philemon obviously considered him this because Paul converted Philemon. Paul was the one that, that risked and sacrificed so much to help Philemon become a Christian. Look at what it says in verse 1. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. See, Paul has indicated a partnership in the gospel with Philemon. So since this condition is met, Paul being a partner with Philemon, then we can see the next step. Because of the condition, now let's look at the result. Here it is in verse 17. Welcome him as you would welcome me. So here's a condition. If you consider me a partner, a fellow worker in Christ, then welcome Onesimus as you would welcome me. See, he says, listen, Philemon, you are to receive Onesimus the same way you will receive me if I showed up there. This is how you're to be. Treat Onesimus the way you would treat Paul. Paul was a substitute for Onesimus. You say, whoa, wait a minute, I don't get this. Yeah, so here he is, he's reading this letter from the Apostle Paul, and it says, welcome him, Onesimus, as you would welcome me, Paul. It says, forgive Onesimus as you would forgive me, Paul. It says, hold no obligations against Onesimus as you would not hold any against me, Paul. Take him back, Onesimus, take him back just as you would take me, Paul, back. So as Philemon was standing there, and here's Onesimus looking at him, handing him this letter from the Apostle Paul. You know, he was angry. Here's his former slave. He ran away from him. He stole things from him. And now he's coming back and here's this letter. And as he's full of anger, he's reading his letter. And then he's thinking, wow, you are my brother in Christ now. The person that converted me converted you. So as I stand here looking at you, Onesimus, I stand looking at my father in the faith, the Apostle Paul. I can't hold anything against you. You are my brother in Christ. Now I say this because we've got to remember, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We cannot hold anything against each other. Just as we have been forgiven, God has forgiven our brothers and sisters in Christ. And just as Paul took Onesimus' place, Jesus takes our place. See, Paul appeals to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. Jesus appeals to our God and Father in heaven on our behalf. Father, accept them as you would accept me. See, at the heart of Christianity is the doctrine of substitution. That's what it's about. Christ's death on the cross shows a substitution. Christ, the righteous, pure, sinless person, Substituting for sinners, those wretched, thieving sinners. It's also described as vicarious. The word in Latin means one in place of another. That's what vicarious means, one in place of another. So the death of Jesus is vicarious. In other words, Jesus is the substitute for you and me. He bears the sin. He bears our burdens. He bears our load so we don't have to. Look at what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 
God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It says Jesus, he had no sin, but he became sin for us. Look at what it says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. God's holy wrath was poured out on Jesus Christ. Why? So that you and I could be free. This is what he did for us. So just as Paul says, listen, I'm going to be the substitute for Onesimus. Philemon, forgive him. He is your brother. Treat him as you would treat me. Jesus is saying, God, I will be the substitute for Maurice. I will be the substitute for you. Treat him as you would treat me, Father. This is an incredible substitute that we have in Christ Jesus. One in place of another. It's vicarious. And you got to say, well, well, why did he do that? Why would he take the place? Why would the Apostle Paul be willing to take on all the debt, all the, all the hurt that Onesimus caused Philemon? Well, it's the same thing. Why would Jesus take on all our sin, all our debt that we would owe for our penalty? A very simple reason. Because, point number two, we have an unbelievable debt. We have an unbelievable debt. Look in verse 18, Philemon, verse 18. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. See, Onesimus has incurred a debt that he could never, ever repay. See, he owed debt, a debt to Philemon. Now, first of all, it was a monetary debt. He owed money. But not only that, he had stolen some things from Philemon. So he had a way to pay for his life after he ran out of slavery. So he was being a runaway slave was a big deal because it would normally cost back in during that time, 60 AD, about 500 denarii for a slave. Now, a denarii is a full day's wage. So it would be 500 days of working to pay off his debt. Now, that's like your full pay goes straight to your debt. So you have nothing for yourself. So imagine it would be over a year and a half of working to pay off the debt of just being a runaway slave. But you got to have money to live, money to eat. So it would take more than a year and a half. But this is what he says. Listen, he has a debt that he owes that he could never, ever pay back. Paul says, I'm willing to pay that debt. This was an incredible moment as Philemon was reading that letter. Can you imagine the emotions, the thought he must have had that must have went through him? Now, conceivably, is it possible that Philemon could have been paid off by Onesimus? That's totally possible. It could have been. If he had just decided to just work and, and do all he could for years and years and years, he could have paid him back for that. But then there's another debt that he owed. Because according to Roman law, if you were a runaway slave, the penalty for that was death. Now that was a debt he couldn't just pay off. He couldn't work off. No matter how long he worked, he would never be able to pay off the debt of death. See, this is a very dark picture. He owed more money than he could pay off. Plus, even if he did, he still would have to die because of the, the sin, the crime that he committed. Yet, that is exactly the picture that we face if we live without Jesus Christ. A life without Jesus means we will have a debt that we could never, ever pay back. If we had all of eternity to work off our debt, it still wouldn't be enough for a down payment on it. We have so much unbelievable debt that we owe God. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ. Well, what is this? Look over in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. It says, And the Lord commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, 
but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The debt in which God placed as a penalty for disobedience was more than physical death. See, physical death is a result of a penalty, but the result of our disobedience to God is spiritual death. That takes it to a whole nother level. Let me say it again. The physical death is a result of a penalty. You did something. You know, Onesimus ran away. He has a physical death that would pay the price. But when it comes to our disobedience to God, that's when a spiritual death comes into play. And that's not something you can pay off, a spiritual debt. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. This is what Paul is saying, the effects of having sin in our lives. Paul says, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sin. See, sin is missing the mark of holiness. That's what sin literally means. You're missing the mark of perfect holiness, a mark that you and I, we have all missed. Look in James chapter two, verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. See, we, like Onesimus, are lawbreakers. And under the death sentence, because of our disobedience to Christ. You know, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3. We have all sinned. Every single one of us that have sinned, we've fallen short of the glory of God. We have incurred a spiritual death because of our sin. But yet, here's Jesus. And here he is telling his story. His story for us to understand. Look at what it says in verse 18, Philemon, verse 18 again. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. Now, again, we have an unbelievable debt. Onesimus had an unbelievable debt. And Paul said, charge it to me. We have an unbelievable debt. And Jesus says, charge it to me. Now, this transitions me to my last point I want to make for us here. Not only do we have an incredible substitute, we have an unbelievable debt, but point number three is this. We have an unbelievable payment also. Look again in verse 19. Philemon, verse 19, the first part of that, it says, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. Now, Paul said, I'm writing this with my own hand. Usually, Paul would uh, say things and have a scribe write it for him, but if we look at this in verse 19 through 25, Paul says, listen, I'm writing this with my own hand. He would normally close out his letters in his own hand. Someone else would write it for him, but then he would close it out. As he's closing it out, he says, I will repay it. And he wanted to make sure he wrote that in his own hand, not somebody else, so they can pretend or make up stories about it. He says, no, this is my handwriting. I will repay it. The Apostle Paul takes on whatever debt Onesimus has in regards to Philemon. Now, Paul had an idea of the extent of the, of the theft and the debt that he owes because of being a runaway slave. And it was Paul's heart that the bonds of fellowship would not be broken because of Onesimus' sin, his debt. He says, I'm willing to pay whatever needs to be paid to keep the bonds of fellowship. Now here's Paul. He wasn't even involved in it. He wasn't a part of Onesimus and Philemon's life before all this happened. But he said, I'm going to step in. And because the bonds of fellowship are so important to me, I'm willing to pay the price for somebody else. This is an incredible lesson we need to understand. Because this is how important unity the bond of fellowship, different people coming together. This needs to be our heart. This needs to be how important it is for us that we have a bond of fellowship. We can look at Paul. He says, look, I wasn't even involved in what happened, 
but I'm willing to sacrifice and pay a price to make sure we still have peace and bonding in our relationship. He was so concerned about reconciliation that he will pay whatever the price may be. Guys, this needs to be our heart. That as we look in our fellowship, that we see people that may have tension, challenges in their marriage, in their family, just in their relationship, we have to step in and you say, well, that's not my business. And that's how most people are in the big cities. You know, mind your own business. Don't even worry about it. They need to handle their own selves. But as a brotherhood, as a fellowship, we need to step in and make sure there's a bond of peace and unity in our fellowship. Because of this great love and desire that Paul had, he calls for us to be reconciled to God. Jesus says, listen, I'm willing to pay the ultimate price. First Peter chapter one, starting verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, we believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. This is so important for us to understand. The last line I read there says, so your faith and hope are in God. Listen to me. I, if you miss anything else, please tune into this. Your faith, your hope needs to be in God. Not in church, not in a church building, not in a preacher, not in any person. Your hope and faith needs to be in God. That means when something doesn't go the way you think it should, your hope and faith is in God. I'm going to trust God that he's going to take care of the situation. We can't get so angry with people that we think about leaving God or God's church. You can't because now your hope is in people. People will let you down, but if your hope and faith is in God, it doesn't matter what people do because you know God will handle the situation. This is important for us to grasp because God is calling us to reconcile, to be there for each other. But sometimes we say they're just so prideful or they just never listen. We're giving up. God says, no, no, no. I'm putting you there because you can help make a difference. Here's the apostle Paul. He wasn't even involved in a situation, but he said, my heart is for unity so much that I'm going to get involved to bring about unity. Jesus, the apostle Paul, shows us how important unity in the fellowship is. We have to work together. We cannot let little issues of anger and uh, mistrust and, and having bitterness fester in our hearts. We have got to resolve these things so we can move on. The debt that you and I cannot pay, Jesus paid for us. He went to the cross at Calvary. He died on the cross. And as he was on that cross, hanging there, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He didn't understand what was going on, but he still trusted that God was in control. Guys, you may not understand all this happening, but you still have to trust that God is in control. Now, I know some of us say, well, I do trust that God's in control. Okay, if you trust that God is in control, you would not get angry and frustrated with the people that Jesus died for. You won't get upset with your brothers and sisters and have a thought of leaving God or leaving the church if you're trusting God. This is a very specific and detailed thing we need to understand. Our faith and our hope needs to be in God. That's why we read our Bible every day. That's why we need to pray every day. 
If you don't read your Bible and pray every day, you can't say your hope and faith is in God because you're not talking to God. You're not letting them talk to you. If you just go on about your day, your hope and faith is in what you can do. It's in your efforts. But if you're reading, you're praying, you're just trying to have some fellowship, some kind of way, your hope and faith can be in God. You say, but I'm in my house and, and we still got the virus and the mask and all these things. Listen, if your hope and faith is in God, you'll make it happen. You'll be able to call somebody on the phone. You can pray with people on the phone. You don't have to be face to face to pray with somebody. The question is, where is your hope and your faith? Is it in God? The Son of God endured a spiritual, painful death for you and me. Jesus did that for you and me. Jesus paid for the consequences of our sin. See, we were the only ones that did the sins that we did. But Jesus says, even though I wasn't there, even though I didn't do the sins, I'm willing to step in and pay the ultimate price for you. This is what it's about. Man's debt is similar, but it's not the debt of a credit card. You know, if you have a credit card and you, and you pay something on it, if you don't pay enough, all you're going to do is pay the basic amount and it's going to carry over and last years and years and years. That's just a horrible feeling. I've been there. I know. But there you have to have a plan to work it out. And the plan for you is Jesus Christ. Jesus paid for the consequences of our sin on the cross. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 again. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Now, the good news is that we no longer owe anything because Jesus paid the ultimate price for us. So we don't owe anything. Our account is wiped clean. There's nothing there. We have a zero balance when it comes to our sinful spiritual life. Jesus did the ultimate thing of paying the price for our sin. But here, you got to hear this. Not only did he pay the price for our sin, he wiped our account clean. Zero balance when it comes to sin. So not only did he do that, but then he said, you know what? Not only am I going to wipe it clean, your debt of sin, I'm going to also put a deposit in for you. So even though you're walking away with, with no more debt, I'm going to give you something in response. Again, look at the second part of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He said, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what did he do? He wiped away all of our debt of sin. And then he put in the righteousness of God. He said, I'm going to take all your debt of sin away, but I'm going to deposit righteousness. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to help you as you walk on your journey, as you do what you should do for the Lord. He says, not only am I clearing your debt, but I'm giving you something in response. Oh my goodness. Therefore, when God looks upon the people that have put their faith in his son, Jesus Christ, you know what he sees? He not only sees our sins being taken away, but when he looks at us, he sees us covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Again, our sins are gone. And his view of us is that of his son, Jesus Christ, because his righteousness now covers us. Let me share a story with you here. A man was caught stealing milk that had been delivered to a store. He had been arrested and was taken before the judge. The judge asked him, how do you plead? There was only one way he could plead because he had been caught in the act of stealing. So he pleaded guilty. He asked for leniency, for he had two small babies at home and nothing to give them. And instead of seeing them starve, he resorted to stealing. He said, judge, I plead for the mercy of the court. The judge said that since he had pleaded guilty, the only alternative was to find him guilty and assess a fine for him. The fine was $10. The man stood there discouraged for he anticipated a jail sentence because he had nothing to pay the fine with. Then the judge got up, 
laid his gavel down, walked off the bench, walked over to the clerk's desk and paid the $10 himself. He set the man free. Then he approached the man, wrote a check for $100 so he could provide for his family's needs. See, there was no question of guilt. There was no injustice for the sentence. Yet the one who found him guilty also paid his debt and set him free. Our sin was paid for by Jesus, the only one who was perfect, who never sinned. Not only did he pay for our debt, but at the same time, he blessed us with his Holy Spirit, his righteousness, an incredible transaction, removal of sin and debt, blessing with righteousness and the Holy Spirit. This is what we need to understand when we look at Philemon. We need to see it from a slave's point of view. The humility it took for Onesimus to go back to his slave owner Philemon. The humility it took for him to do that, to apologize, to say I'm sorry, was a lot. But then we need to look at Philemon. The humility he had to have to have forgiveness of the person that ran away from him and stole from him, who hurt him, hurt his family personally. He still forgave him because of what Jesus had did for him and for Onesimus. Then we look at the Apostle Paul, someone who was not involved, but because he was about his mission of helping people come to Christ, he just mended a relationship forever. We sometimes forget the people that we help come to Christ mend so many relationships in their lives. Why? It's not that we've done something great, but it's God that has done something great to heal and mend the relationships in their lives. See, we're not just sharing our faith so we can have more people in the church. No, we share our faith so we can help people's lives come into a relationship with God so they can heal, they can mend, they can be with God for eternity. This is why we do what we do, because we're grateful for what God has already done for us. And once we are set free, just like Onesimus, then we ourselves can have that kind of heart that says free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we free at last. Let us pray for the bread and the cup. Almighty God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to just learn from your word. Father, we know that we have been in all three positions at some point. Onesimus, the Apostle Paul, Philemon. But I pray that wherever we are today, we will take it all back to the cross. That our hope, our faith will be in you, God our Father. Thank you so much for the bread, for the cup once again. Thank you for this time of us remembering what Jesus has done for us. We love you and thank you. And it's in your son, Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
Thank you again for joining us at the Bronx region of the New York City Church of Christ for just being part of our, our family. And thank you again, Maurice, for that sermon. We thank you so much just for going on this ride with us um, during this Black History Month. We pray that all of the lessons and the sermons really just impacted your heart. We are thankful for those that have gone before us to really um, allow for us to enjoy life in the way that we do. We know there is much to go, but we believe that Jesus is the answer and um, Jesus is the one who helps us truly be together and be able to love each other regardless of race, regardless of gender, culture, and background. And with that being said, as we end Black History Month week, next week we kick off Women's History Month, and next Sunday our service is going to be our Women's Day celebration entitled United. So I hope that you will invite your friends, host a watch party. It is going to be a special, special service right here on YouTube. So that's going to be at 11 a.m., but the guys are going to get together at 10 a.m. for a Zoom meeting. So make sure you get that link and uh, we'll be getting together the same Sunday at 10 a.m. So the women can have their time and we can hang out with the kids. So they'll be uninterrupted to worship God for that women's service. And this week we're going to actually also have a men's midweek on Wednesday, March 2nd at 7.30. So please um, reach out to your Bible talk leader for the Zoom link or whoever invited you so you can join the men's midweek service. So we're looking forward to a whole bunch of great things. So we're, as we're getting into to March, we want to march on with our faith. We want to march forward. We want to be spiritually mad for God and do some crazy things. So we're going to be starting off with some prayer chains in March. Uh, your Bible talk leader should give you some information, but if you don't know about that, please reach out to them. If you're visiting for the first time, reach out to somebody and talk to them about how we're going to pray up this month and how there's going to be miracles that are happening. So at this time, we're going to pray for the many needs that are happening 
around the world and right here in our ministry. Let's go to God in prayer. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, God, you're an amazing, awesome God. Uh, we thank you so much for all that you do and all that you're going to do. We thank you for this service today, God, and uh, we just pray that you continue to protect us and, and watch over us. Watch over the people who are at war in Russia. Keep us safe here in the United States. Uh, we continue to pray for, for Leon, for Dexter, for uh, the gay family, uh, for just everyone who's going through uh, struggles at this time. God, continue to protect us, to, to guide us, and uh, just give us hope and a future in our Lord Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.